Hi, my name is Audrey M. Ryan Beardsley from Arizona State University, Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College, working today with interviewing Lee Shulman, Dr. Lee Shulman, who is Charles E. DeComen, Professor of Education Emeritus, Stanford, and President Emeritus, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and also National Academy of Education member. Today we have the pleasure of introducing Lee Shulman to our audience members. Hi, Lee. Hello. Becoming Lee, you were the only son of Jewish immigrants. From where did your parents come? My dad was born in the city of Lodz in Poland, and uh, his family came to North America, to Canada, when he was four, but uh, didn't get to the United States till he was middle teens, mm -hmm. to Columbus, Georgia, where mm -hmm. his dad was a rabbi. And my mother came at the age of 14 from Lithuania. and. Uh, went directly to Chicago. And where did they meet? In Chicago. In Chicago. They, they met working in, uh, they both had jobs in the Hart Schaffner and Marx men's suit factory huh. uh, in Chicago working on the assembly line. Okay. Yeah. And were you born in Chicago? I was. Okay. I was. And your dad was a delicatessen owner. That was That was his last failed business. I mean, there were others before that. Okay. Dad worked on the assembly line in factories uh, especially during World War II. Uh, then had his own woodworking little factory that never really made it and then lucked out and had a chance to buy this deli. And uh, that was the most successful business dad ever had. Mom and dad worked in it together. Unfortunately, he died before reaching the age of 50, so oh. it never really enjoyed uh, the, uh, the deli very long, but my mother with her second grade education actually ran it more profitably than my dad had. Hmm. So, uh, uh, but it was a very formative part of my early life. And did you have siblings? No. No, it's only no. child? No. Tell us about your experiences at Yeshiva High School and how that influenced the scholar you've become. Well, my grandfather, who was a rabbi and was in New Jersey by the time I was born, um, very much wanted me to get a rich Jewish education, and the only way to really do that in Chicago at the time was to uh, go to a Jewish day school uh, where you got all of your education, both your Jewish education and your general education, in the same institution. And the, uh, there wasn't much choice. There was one of these, mm -hmm. and it was about an hour's commute from my home. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, my parents enrolled me in it. It was called the Chicago Jewish Academy. From age, well, from sixth grade through graduating from high school, so it was almost about six years. And for much of that time, I would be, spend the morning in a yeshiva, in a, essentially a theological seminary, uh, studying Talmud. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after lunch, we would get to the trivial stuff like English literature and algebra and geometry mm -hmm. and uh, biology and physics, you know, the stuff that you didn't have to be wide awake for. <laughs> sure. Sleep your way through it. Yeah, yeah. You speak, speak Hebrew, is I that do, correct? I do. Is that where you learned Hebrew? I learned Hebrew there, but I also went to a Jewish summer camp, mm. a two-month camp, which was not as orthodox. It was uh, a more liberal camp, uh, and so it actually created a kind of interesting dialectic between a much more modern perspective on what it meant to study Jewish texts and to be Jewish, and a far more traditional one in my school. Uh, but it also was the place where I learned much more Hebrew, because it was a Hebrew-speaking camp. Mm -hmm. We were expected to speak Hebrew during the day. And okay. I don't think I ever dreamt in Hebrew, but it was. And were you a good student in school? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was good, I was, uh, I was a speaker at graduation, and oh, okay. uh, got a scholar, full scholarship to the University of Chicago. Uh, in spite of studying all that import, unimportant stuff only after one o'clock in the afternoon. How did those formidable experiences influence your scholarship, or did they? Oh, yeah, I think they did uh, enormously. I think what, what uh, if, you, if you are kind of uh, invested in the practices of Jewish learning, they are entirely organized around the study of texts. Mm. I mean, whether the text is the Torah or the Talmud or any text. And the basic notion uh, 
that I think I internalized was that texts are terribly important. Mm. They ought to be revered and respected, but never taken at their word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that a text is a, uh, a starting point for understanding something. But until you begin to exercise your own interpretive capacities, and until you begin to seek out multiple interpretations of that text from others who are either your predecessors who may have existed five and six hundred years ago or are your contemporaries with whom you're studying now or whose work you're reading, you can't begin to understand what the text says. And so I think it developed in me a set of, of uh, dispositions as well as skills that, ha that boy, do they transfer to the academy. Mm. I mean, the academy is all about publish or perish, uh, and I don't mean that in the promotion sense. I mean, uh, in the academy, uh, the first principle is, if you've got some good ideas, publish them or your ideas are going to perish. Mm. They'll just disappear. And if you want to find out the very best ideas that others have had, read what they've published but read it critically, read it analytically, read it skeptically, and keep on interrogating the texts. And that's very much the Jewish tradition of reading texts. Don't just accept them, wrestle with them. And I must say that when I left the yeshiva and went to the University of Chicago, which was then you know, the, the home of the great books of mm. the Hutchins approach to reading original sources, never reading textbooks, those dispositions and orientations and skills in diving into text, whether you're reading Galileo's Dialogue, Shakespeare's Tempest, or William Harvey on the Circulation of the Blood, uh, I mean, your assumption was, if I try to skim this, I'm not going to get it. Because hmm. nothing worth reading is skimmable in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you want the plot of the Tempest, pfft, that's notes. fine. Yeah, or <laughs> Cliff Notes. But that's just it. Cliff Notes are a skim. Mm -hmm. uh, and what this meant was read deeply, read analytically, read critically and skeptically. And um, I mean, I think that that it it formed my academic identity in many ways. Uh, complete with its limitations. I mean, because there's more to life than text. Mm -hmm. um, but for a very long time, my orientation toward education and psychology was dominated by the centrality of the written word. Mm -hmm. And I think that, well, as I said, over time, I kind of came to understand that every, every virtue like that comes with its own liabilities and its own limitations. And uh, it's one of the things that maturing as a scholar and as a teacher require of you to acknowledge your strengths, but also recognize that in principle, every strength has some hidden weaknesses which you ought to learn to either acknowledge or if you can't, overcome. What do you believe are some of the fundamental texts in education, foundational? Um, well, for me, uh, they start out with some pretty old ones. Mm. Um, Plato's Ethics, uh, Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Ethics. Um, I mean, I, I, I go back to those Greek sources often. Um, I think in the Jewish tradition, uh, the Jewish tradition is so filled with texts that deal with teaching and learning. Mm. I mean, it's no accident that the word Torah means teaching. Mm. That's what the Hebrew word means. Mm. And um, so it's very much, you know, those texts are extremely important. Uh, getting more, more modern, I would say, uh, the work of John Dewey has had an mm. enormous impact sure. on me. Uh, no accident that I studied them with one of the great teachers of all time, uh, the late Joseph Schwab at the University of Chicago, who in many ways was a mentor and a role model. And remained so until he died. Um, the, uh, other than those, I mean, it's, it's, uh, 
Uh, Phil Jackson's Life in Classrooms was an eye-opener. Um, it's hard to... The older I got, the more texts I found influential. Sure. And uh, uh, every year, I'll often add something that I just read that turns my head and gets me thinking in new ways. So Sure. Even within and outside of the field, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. When you were at Chicago, you met a very special person there. Who was this person and how did you meet? I, I have a feeling you have an answer in mind. <laughs> She's behind us. <laughs> well, but I didn't meet my wife, Judy, at the University oh, of Chicago. Okay. No, I met her at summer camp. Oh, okay. So so somebody gave you. Maybe poor, at the time. It must have at been. At the time it, you were at Yeah, you were yeah. Okay. My guess is that the sources of most of your misinformation <laughs> is Gary Fenstermacher. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Yes, I, I actually met Judy when I was at the University of Chicago, and uh, uh, this is a relationship that's still, you know, being built. We've only been married 50 years, oh. and uh, we've uh, raised three great kids and about five grandchildren, and uh, uh, have done some writing and some research together, although too much of that would put a good marriage at risk. <laughs> but we, we have done a lot of work together, and our work overlaps and intersects a great deal. But we had no anticipation that that was going to be the case when we met. <laughs> she remembers that before you were married, her older brother sat you down. <laughs> and you already know what I'm going to say. Yes. <laughs> and he wanted to know how you intended to support her during your marriage. You said you were planning to be a philosopher. When he asked, what do philosophers do? What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, that was great. I mean, here I was a philosophy major, essentially. Uh, all of us at Chicago were philosophy majors. <laughs> um, and, um, and so David, who was going to be a doctor, and of course doctors know what they're going to do because mm -hmm. there are doctor shows on television and people go to the doctor. And here I was majoring in philosophy and nobody knows what a philosopher does because who goes to a philosopher? Mm -hmm. you know, when you've got a, you know, a, a, a transcendental pain, I mean, do you go to a philosopher? And the fact is, I was majoring in philosophy, but I had no idea what philosophers did. Because he, clearly he meant do for a living. Mm -hmm. And I was probably all of 20 when he asked me that question, uh, in love with his 18-year-old baby sister. And uh, so all I could come up with, Audrey, was philosophers make distinctions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? That was an... Uh, that was a conversation stopper. He had no way to, where to go on that one. And I think he just began going to the bottom line of, aren't you worried that you won't be able to support my sister? Sure. In the manner to which he's accustomed. And uh, I don't know, did Judy tell you the coda to that story? No. Huh? Yeah. Well, I guess it, it turns out that a lot of my writing over the years has involved making distinctions. That came true. You know, between content knowledge and pedagogical content knowledge. You know, well, things, these sorts of things. And I was never particularly self-conscious about that. And then in about 1996, I find myself being interviewed by a headhunter uh, who is looking for a new president for the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. And I was very happily in my Stanford professorship and didn't seek this job. And found myself being invited to interview. And at the end of about a three-hour interview, uh, the guy from the search firm leans over to me and he says, you know, Lee, I should, probably shouldn't say this, but I think you'd make a really fine president for the Carnegie Foundation. And never having been an administrator of anything except the Institute for Research on Teaching in my life, I said, why in the world would you think that? And he looked at me and said, well, I've read a lot of your stuff. You make such lovely distinctions. Mm. And I thought to myself, you know, here we are decades and decades later, <laughs> And it turned out that the response I gave my future brother-in-law was remarkably prescient, that that's what I do, I make distinctions. You and predicted it, your own destiny. I did, I did. And uh, <laughs> so be, be wary of what you say. It may anticipate more than you think. <laughs> so three degrees from the University of Chicago. By the yes. time you were how old? 24. 24. So you have a bachelor's in philosophy? Bachelor's with a concentration in philosophy. Okay. Chicago... Everybody took the same courses at Chicago. And then if you had, as I did, a year left before you could get a bachelor's degree, because you had to have spent four years, uh, you had to concentrate in something. So I did a bachelor's thesis, a tutorial in epistemology, because I thought that was interesting. 
you know, where does knowledge come from? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean for people to know? Again, not really anticipating that's what, be, what my career, career was about. Be, sure, <laughs> yeah. sure. Yeah. And then the PhD in educational psychology right. by the time age 24. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Well, you know, I had this wife and set of responsibilities and sure. was ready to get on with it. You studied with Benjamin Bloom? I did. And acknowledging the influence of your mentor, you created a new ta taxonomy, Shulman's Table of Learning. Many years later. Yeah. What did this one have that Bloom's taxonomy did not? It wasn't what it had that Bloom's taxonomy didn't. When, when Bloom did his work with his collaborators like uh, Mazia and others, um, they started with the cognitive taxonomy. That was the taxonomy for many years. And um, it, uh, in some ways, uh, reflected both the power and the narrowness of the uh, perspective that I developed at the yeshiva, that it was all about the work of the mind. It was all about intellect. Mm -hmm. It was all about cognitive understanding. And in fact, it was called Bloom's, uh, the Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, colon, Cognitive Domain. Uh, they re recognized from the very beginning that they would need parallel taxonomies that dealt with what for them were two other domains, the affective or mm -hmm. emotional domain mm -hmm. and the psychomotor or performance domain. And these came out years later, but never really had the impact of the cognitive, okay. which remains, I think, to this day, probably the most widely used and mm -hmm. translated uh, across the world uh, framework for looking analytically mm -hmm. at learning. Um, and I was by then the president of the foundation, and what had happened to me at the foundation in large measure because of the people I recruited to be my colleagues, because I, I really recruited people to the foundation who in significant ways, probably even more than I anticipated, uh, were substantively and philosophically different from me. So that I suppose in retrospect, I think of it like, uh, like Abraham Lincoln's cabinet, you know, which was a, uh, what was the name of the book that was written? I forget, but it talked about the diversity of views that Lincoln organized into his cabinet. And, and so I began to realize that I was thinking much more about the intellectual in relation to the moral and the emotional. Mm. And the, the, these, these ideas were beginning to penetrate each other. And that you really couldn't understand the intellectual absent the performative. Mm -hmm. and the practical and the what could people do. Uh, but they wouldn't do anything unless there were emotional or affective or motivational component. And I became more and more dissatisfied with thinking about these as separate domains. Mm -hmm. So the table of learning is, was simply a way of trying to blend into a single analytic framework uh, those intellectual and moral, emotional, and social, and performative, yeah. And, and in the same article, I kind of look back at the end of the article and still try to point out, again, something I would not have been able to do when I was less mature, uh, even with this attempt to blend all these things, here were some things that I still had left out and mm, hadn't done justice sure, to. Sure. Which, again, I think is one of our responsibilities. We've got to try to be as penetrating as we can in our work and try at the same time to be cognizant of what we've left out. Uh, you, you've got to leave stuff out or you'll be so broad and fuzzy mm -hmm. that you'll illuminate nothing. It's like having a spotlight that tries to cover a stage as you open it up that is so large that at a certain point, there's no light on any one point of the stage because sure. there's you've you've brought. So you, if you want to see something sharply, you've got to narrow the beam. But then to see the whole stage, you've either got to get other folks with other beams and work with them collaboratively, uh, or you acknowledge, look, this is what I understand, and I'm really clueless about the rest of it. And before you go into action on these ideas, make sure you've taken account of the rest of it, or you'll make some deep errors. Sure. Yeah. What brought you to Michigan State? It was the only job offer I had. Oh. I mean, uh, I'd like to be able to say, well, I put these, 
these... Uh, You're turning them away. Right, right. <laughs> no, no. I mean, one of the things about Chicago, Audrey, is that it was, again, its, it's, it's weakness and its strength. My colleagues at Chicago didn't give a damn about what the rest of the field was doing. Hmm. Their view was, at Chicago, we break new ground. We go where the problems really are. Eventually, the rest of the field will catch up with us. Hmm. And so uh, when Joe Schwab did curriculum theory, he didn't do the same kind of curriculum theory everybody else was doing. And when, uh, uh, I mean, my orientation toward learning was very cognitive, you know, asking questions about how do people think and about the mind at a time when all of psychology was behavioristic. Mm. And so I go out to interview at Michigan State for a learning position. Mm. And I thought I had done a, done a great job. Well, they concluded halfway through the first day that I didn't know the field of learning at all because I was spent giving no attention to people like Thorndike and Hull and Spence and uh, uh, Osgood and all the people who were the key people. I, the fact is, I thought they were laughable. Mm. And I was reading Bruner and I was reading Herbert Simon and... I mean, this is the early 60s. This work was younger than new. And so I didn't know any of the literature that the people in learning saw as the learning literature. So I never got an offer for the job that I applied for. And I thought I was going to be unemployed my first year after the PhD. And then I got a very late call from Michigan State offering me a job I didn't even know was there, which was teaching the broad undergraduate ed psych course hmm. to 500 students in the morning and 500 in the afternoon. Um, and I learned later that I was the second choice for that job. <laughs> uh, and they finally, when they were turned down by their first choice, they remembered me. And I think my virtue was I didn't seem to know anything in particular, <laughs> uh, much, you know, hardly learning. But I seemed to know a little about a lot of stuff. And maybe that, that would work that well work, sure. for the introductory ed psych course. So it worked fine. But that's why I went to Michigan State. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think Judy and I, Judy began teaching fourth grade at the time oh. uh, in the area. Uh, you know, between us, I was making $9,000 for 12 months and she was making 4500 or something. Oh, wow. And we, we had this experience of being unbelievably wealthy. And, um, uh, but it was a great place. and where we thought we were going to go for two or three years, we ended up, ended up spending 19 years there. 19 years there. Yeah. While there, you worked with your roommate and good friend, Arthur Elstein. Tell us about Arthur. <laughs> Arthur and I met at summer camp, same place where I met Judy. Uh, he came from Chicago as well, University of Chicago. Uh, we, uh, had been, we had shared an apartment as students at the University of Chicago. Uh, he was a graduate student. I was an undergrad. We shared it as, uh, with two others. And uh, we were each other's best men at our mm -hmm. respective weddings, and we were very, very close. Arthur got his PhD in clinical psychology and human development, went off to Harvard and joined the medical school faculty there. And I went to Michigan State. And uh, in the late 60s, I was by then a, a full professor in the ed school. And a guy comes into my office, introduces himself as the dean of the not yet existent medical school at Michigan mm -hmm. State. And he said, I'm, I'm Andy Hunt. I come from Stanford, where I was professor of pediatrics. And we're starting a new medical school here. And unlike a lot of people in my field, I think educating physicians is much too important to be left to other physicians. Mm. And I understand that you study how people solve complex problems. I said, yeah, you, you could say that. He said, well, I think that's what medicine is all about. Would you be prepared to take 50% of your appointment Oh, wow. and move it to the medical school and help us learn how to teach people to solve problems. Mm. And uh, that sounded like a neat possibility, besides which the medical school buildings, which were quite new, were the only ones on campus that were centrally air-conditioned. And um, I think uh, you're married to someone who grew up in mid-Michigan, so he can tell you about what the summers are like mm -hmm. in mid-Michigan. And air-conditioning is, is to be valued. Anyway, uh, uh, they immediately encouraged me to start some research on how physicians solve problems and make diagnoses. And I thought to myself, God, this, is, this could be very exciting, but it's a lot to do alone. So 
I persuaded my new colleagues uh, to recruit Arthur Elstein from Harvard to come to Michigan State so we could do this work together. You know, Arthur's first reaction was leave Harvard for, you know, a cow college in the Midwest. Uh, but the more he saw the potential of what we could do by, in helping to start a brand new medical school and this really pioneering research, uh, we pried him loose from Harvard. He came to Michigan State and we began a 10-year collaboration on medical problem solving. It resulted in a book that was published in 78 by the Harvard University Press that remained in press for 30 years. Uh, still one of the most widely cited, maybe the most widely cited book uh, to this day on that topic of how physicians solve diagnostic problems. Um, it, uh, it certainly shifted my whole orientation to how to look at teaching because I was already cognitively inclined but this work on physicians really shaped up a lot of stuff. And uh, it changed Arthur's career because here's somebody who was a clinical psychologist, you know, whose dissertation was on the Rorschach test. Mm. He eventually became the, the president of the Society for Medical Decision Making and the first editor of the Journal for Medical Decision. I mean, it, he became the leading person in that field. Sure. And it was just a, a wonderful, I mean, it's a lovely example of accident and chance and good fortune. Uh, utterly changing the course of somebody's career. Yeah, to this day, he, say, he says that that book is your most significant accomplishment. Oh, he thinks that's my most but significant accomplishment. He does, accomplishment. yeah. But he also, <laughs> he also remembers a time when you were, he, I think he served as your, um, your counselor, junior counselor, or you served as his junior counselor yes, at the camp. Yes, at camp, at camp. And there was a night then you had a cabin of 13-year-old boys. And what happened after you turned the lights off? Do you remember? I wonder if, if he's confounding several different stories. He says you were on the porch of the cabin listening to the boys, and one was telling oh, the other. Oh, yeah. Now, I, don't, I didn't think that was with Arthur. I actually think it was in another setting. I think the story that he's telling you was that we turned off the light, and the kids had thought yeah. that we had left, and, but, but the counselor and, uh, that I was junior counselor to and I were very quietly sitting in the front half of the cabin, which is yeah. somewhat mm -hmm. separated, uh, in our part of the cabin, and listening to the kids, these 13-year-old boys, uh, discuss sex. <laughs> and uh, it was great. It was, it was, there was one boy <laughs> who uh, actually had the information correct. And he was proceeding to regale the other kids with the details of the sex act. And the other kids were listening, all lying in their beds, in disbelief, <laughs> in disbelief. Uh, and, you know, they were saying, no, no, that, that can't be the way babies are made and women get pregnant. And finally, one little boy uh, whose voice we recognized, even in the dark, said, that can't be because my mommy is pregnant now and I know she and my dad didn't do that. <laughs> And the other kid who was telling, giving the instruction, said authoritatively, how can you be so sure? And the first little kid said, my daddy wouldn't have the nerve. <laughs> <laughs> to do that to my mommy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> That's hilarious. What about the swimming pool in Champaign, Illinois? I don't remember that story. You're at a fancy mo motel with outdoor swimming pool. You had to take a shower before you could go out to the pool and you came out on the pool deck and you forgot something. Oh, is that when I forgot my bathing <laughs> yeah. suit? Okay, yeah, well, you know, I'd been swimming with all guys for so long at the university. Yeah, I didn't remember that one. Mm -hmm.